I'm Dave DiLorenzo. I'm with the Bancroft Library. Uh, I'll be moderating the next two sessions. Um, and actually, I'm very excited about the next two sessions because I think I had um, a large part in their uh, coming to being. As you can see from the schedule, when we were thinking about how to map out the day, we wanted to, of course, certainly cover records management and life cycle, and you can see part of that in, uh, reflected in this morning's speakers. But we wanted to move on uh, and try to actually uh, present to you um, the sessions that uh, dealt with uh, what's going on on campus and what's going on elsewhere at other campuses at, in the UC system. Um, so I'm very excited about uh, the next, uh, this, this session. Um, the uh, session will be focusing on uh, activities that are going on in both the Chancellor's Office and, and, um, and what has been happening in Academic Senate. Um, but look, uh, first let me just say um, uh, a couple things. Uh, uh, in a large and complex university like ours, where in, in point of fact that we don't have an enterprise-wide uh, records and information management system, um, I think you all would agree with that, um, where we try to have best practices and guidelines and, and, and a records management program from uh, say the, the, the chancellor's office and disseminating all that information uh, about records management throughout the system. Um, we also don't have a single tool to use. Um, and in th this regard, with electronic records, it seems to me very important. Um, this starts to, in my mind with, with designing and implementing a record keeping system for the entire university that's dependent upon the records disposition and retention schedule. But it's also in my mind, though, given the developments over the last 10 years with electronic document management systems, that we are now at a point where we see still at Berkeley, unfortunately, um, a, not an enterprise-wide approach to the use of a single tool where we would be, in fact, a community of users. And so I think one of my um, uh, interests in what will be said today certainly will be touching on two different perspectives. One is a locally grown system, um, which will be Eric Leland, who is former IT manager at um, the Academic Senate, the Berkeley Division, who has developed their own system for managing their records. And this is very common. Um, and you see also uses of SharePoint. I think that was mentioned this morning. And certainly SharePoint has its limitations, even with the version 2010. Um, it just doesn't bring us to the point where we need to be, where we have, um, even with the Chancellor's Office, an uh, electronic document management system like Imagine Now doesn't still have the kinds of functionalities that I'd like to see that implement records management in that software. So I think we'll see later this afternoon when Patrick McGrath talks uh, about where we want to go with this. And that is certainly, in my mind, uh, an electronic document records management system software that we can all use and would be available to us. And hopefully, it would be available to us for free. Can you imagine <laughs> that? All right, so the first uh, person to speak uh, in this session will be Eric Leland, and I will um, um, let him um, start first, and then Cindy Major will follow. Uh, Cindy is the manager of the Chancellor's Communication and Research Center. So first, Eric, you're up to bat. Um, my name is Eric Leland. Um, I was the uh, IT manager uh, at the Academic Senate UC Berkeley for about four years. Um, I'm also a, a partner with a technology firm in Northern California called Five Paths. Um, and in both capacities, I've been spending a lot of time with uh, records management, um, in particular content and document management online in websites and databases, coming up with solutions for uh, small nonprofits universities, uh, government agencies um, to, to solve these kinds of problems. 
Um, I've recently uh, uh, left the position at uh, at the Academic Senate, um, but I from the from when I started about three years ago, this issue with uh, document management and retention was a big deal, and it was one of our big projects was to sort of work on a solution there. So I wanted to kind of walk through um, what this sort of you know, a small group of of, of folks that are. Um, um, highly worked and very overworked, um, you know, came up with as a solution together with us um, and, and put in place. Uh, so taking a look at uh, uh, this project, uh, all projects start with uh, bias, right? We come into it with a certain set of problems and a certain set of expectations for how things ought to be. Um, and this was no different. This is not meant to be negative, but it's more so just acknowledging that you know, this is what we start with, and we need to shake that up a bit. Um, so our, we had biases. Um, one bias was we need software because it solves all the problems, right? Um, so we, we have to challenge that because sometimes that's true and sometimes it's not. It may be surprising in this project. Um, each document that folks imagine putting electronic, again, we have all these paper documents, but, but, but we all imagined in, in the office like, categorizing this in multiple ways. We, in fact, had a file maker system to do so in-house, so a local database that had lots of fields that were categorizing this stuff against wasn't clear if we were really using that, um, but it seemed like a good idea. Um, we should continue to do that. Um, we, it should certainly integrate with whatever we've got. So this old FileMaker 3 database, we should still use it. Um, now, if you don't know, FileMaker is now at version 9 or 10 or 11. I don't know. Uh, 3 is a long time ago. Um, so the, you know, the Senate also can't live a moment without the paper files. So in other words, even though they need to be scanned, we can't let them go. So somehow that has to happen. Um, and of course, this is a large and a complex project, which is you know um, code for it's going to take a lot of time and money. <laughs> so don't expect the answer soon. Um, so that's what we were facing uh, when we came into the room together. Uh, so what were we facing? Uh, you know, in reality, 200,000 paper files, um, and, and they were divided into subject and category folders. So this is definitely what we had. We had a little bit of metadata, so author, date, this sort of thing, across, oh, I don't know, maybe 100 to 200. But that seemed like a big thing until we realized how many documents we actually had. We realized, oh, we don't have any of that data, really. All we have are the documents, the subject, and the category. Um, they're about five pages on average. Uh, a small amount, amount of them had uh, 30 pages, and some, some of them had a, a, a great many more. Um, and about 5% of these files are also kind of you know, unusual or unique in some way. Um, colored paper, stapled, um, maybe written on um, as opposed to typed. Maybe the font was really old or faded, things like that. Um, we looked at this just to see like, what was the general quality, because ultimately the, the problem was um, we need to get rid of the paper. Um, I don't know, the, the desk I sat at had file cabinets on the left and file cabinets on the right, and they were very tall. And I just imagined an earthquake turning into a pancake. Um, <laughs> they were strapped, but you don't want to test that, you know? Um, so, so we need office space. Um, it's time consuming um, to research paper files. We're opening and closing offices, you know, hitting me in the head as they're opening. Um, Lots of existing paper files. We're an all Macintosh office. And of course, we have a very small staff. And so there's nobody that's going to step aside and say, well, I'll manage this thing full time. You know, this is not in the cards, right? So we have to do this in some sort of streamlined way. Um, so we basically needed help. We needed help to digitize the existing 200,000 files. Um, we also needed a process and a system for doing this on an ongoing basis. Because it's one thing to get it all done, but if we don't do it on an ongoing basis, we're just going to get another big pile of file cabinets. Um, we need a simple, cost-effective tool for storing and finding digitized files, don't we all? <laughs> well, so did we. Um, minimal impact on existing staff resources and a Macintosh-friendly solution, um, or, or solutions as the case may be. Um, again, we weren't going to change what network we had, and we know and we knew from the beginning that um, getting a solution on Macintosh systems might be challenging because there's not a lot of business solutions developed, but that's what we had. So what did our process actually entail? It was about a year. Um, and what I wanted to emphasize is it's about a year, but it's about essentially the equivalent of a 20% full-time equivalent employee on the project. This sounds a little strange, but basically it was myself and another person, roughly 10% of either of our time throughout that entire year dealing with this project. Of course, so we're all wearing many hats, so we had many other projects to take up our other 90 to 150% of our time. Um, 
So uh, we basically ended up dividing this project into two parts. There was sort of like, what do we do with the file cabinet stuff? And then what do we do with the electronic files that we get out of that, right? Um, and so the file cabinets had these couple problems where they're already filled up and we're going to keep filling them up, right? So what do we do with the stuff we've got now? What do we do with the stuff going forward? Um, so we had to figure out how do we define the project? What's the budget? What are the ways that we really need to search this stuff? And what are the ways we really need to categorize this stuff? Not all the wish list things, but the real stuff. Um, how do we uh, develop a process for digitizing incoming files? Um, so, you know, all the files at the Senate, basically there's these committees. Um, the committees develop a rich array of resources um, and they get stapled in paper format and um, handed to folks managing these meetings on a weekly basis. Um, so we have to unstaple them and scan them, um, put them somewhere, and make sure that's easy for everybody. Um, and so that's one thing. And then we also have to figure out where, does it, where do those electronic files go and then how do we access them later, right? So again, w what's important to really track about a, a document electronically and how do we need to see it? Because we need to figure out what we need to do with these documents critically. Not all the things we can imagine doing, just specifically what we needed to do. We needed to essentially find the document based on key categories and see it so we could print it, um, typically. That's really what we needed to do. There's a lot of things you can imagine doing around that, but that was the core. Um, we needed to uh, uh, review existing solutions uh, at UC Berkeley in our own office and beyond, but we needed to really make sure that we were using resources we already had because it wasn't, we weren't going to just start buying new stuff. We don't have that kind of money. Um, and then, of course, do a lot of uh, demoing and, and exploring solutions. So that was essentially our process. So our solution, naturally, we kind of relied on existing systems um, as well as some new resources. And so this is kind of a, 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 a broad picture of what happened. Um, so we basically did a, a process for in-house uh, digitization. Um, so in our office, we do a, a massive amount of copies for meetings. Um, that's kind of going away, but still there was a need for kind of one of these, you know, big Cadillac copier systems anyway. That was in the cards. So we said, well, let's leverage that because we can just put an add-on to that that allows us to do, you know, PDF scans um, that are searchable. Brilliant, right? So now we don't have to buy the big copier. At least that's not my cost. That's the whole office thing that was happening already. We can leverage that. So we ended up getting a 5K add-on to that so that now we have this machine that we can use in our process as files come in to make the, make the, uh, uh, the paper turn into PDFs. Um, the biggest cost was a third-party digitization. We weren't going to sit there at that copier and run 200,000 documents through it. There's just nobody to do it, and we couldn't convince a single volunteer student to want to do it. <laughs> we tried. Um, so we, we contracted. Also, uh, the, 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 the reality is, is that it's actually not um, an easy thing to do. Um, you really have to be very meticulous about the paper you shove into the machine and how you do it and what it looks like and do quality control. And uh, it may seem like it's, it's easy peasy, but it's not, and it's good to have some experience around that. Um, so we uh, contracted with a vendor called Peel um, that's in, I believe, Walnut Creek or at least in the Bay Area somewhere. Um, and they're a uh, very good uh, asset for us. Uh, and then we uh, got an electronic document management system in place. We basically used, uh, again, it's zero K. It cost nothing because we used internal resources. Now, we, we looked at a lot of software. I'll talk about that in a minute. But ultimately, what we came down to was we needed to organize these files against subject and category. We needed a naming convention for the files that had a little bit of extra information, such as uh, also subject and category, but also some things like author and date. Um, and then we need to put those into folders and be able to find those. So a lot, a lot like we pulled open the cabinet, now we pull open the folder. But also in Macintosh systems, you have a really easy finder where not only can you find stuff across your computer, but within certain folders. Um, the PDFs are scanned to be fully searchable, so now we can find all sorts of stuff by all kinds of keywords that we could have never imagined. And the deal was, until we could really imagine what the metadata would look like, there was no sense in building that now. But what, would be, what does make sense is to do a lot of searches over time and figure out what's really common. And then maybe over time, we build something more extravagant, right? Um, so that's what we did. Zero K, use our existing Macintosh systems, put them in the file folder, done. Um, and then the paper archive solution, um, the, the, the brilliant resource here at a Bancroft Library, um, to uh, sort of take our paper stuff and 
and give it a loving home. We continued to use that, and we've been using that for a long, long time. And that, that enabled us to ultimately you know, start pushing that information more and more um, in the paper stuff to um, an external resource and not have it in our office. So we did consider many solutions. And when I say solutions, I meant solutions uh, specifically around um, yeah, storing the electronic files, um, maybe some solutions around digitizing them, but mostly storing and retrieving those in, in interesting ways. Um, we considered great and small. We considered solutions that were just file storage utilities that might have had a few bells and whistles that allow us to just put stuff there and then find it. Um, Dropbox and box.net are some examples of those. Uh, we looked at a Macintosh-based solution called Devon Technologies, Devon Think, which is an interesting little add-on to Spotlight um, that allows you to do some additional searching and metadata on, on PDF documents. We looked at common web development systems. That's my experience, and so I have a bit of bias there, um, but I know these solutions pretty well. Um, content management sol solutions basically make a website, allow you to structure your content, and define it using metadata, such as title, author, keywords, so forth. Um, Drupal is a good example. Alfresco is one built more for document management, and they're both open source, meaning we could change it any way to Sunday if we wanted to. Um, too big for our needs. Um, a couple UC Berkeley resources, I remember the one that we spent a bit of time with was uh, Imagine. Um, too large, too involved, that was going to make the, the project complex, and we didn't want to fall to that bias. Um, Kuali was another example. Again, too big, too, I don't know where it is. Um, so we ended up not going there. So my last slide here, I just wanted to kind of cover a couple learnings we had. Um, we, we had a, uh, what they call a post-mortem session. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, <laughs> enlivening. Um, post-mortem session. So you all get together and kind of say, well, how did it all go? Um, really understanding your paper files take time. Um, this is, you know, pretty important. Um, you know, everyone thought they knew these subject files at the Senate, like the back of their hand, because a lot of folks have been there for years and years and years, but really we didn't. Um, and that's really important, and it takes time. And you've got to know them to know how they can be critically categorized to, to reduce the amount of complexity um, so that you're not paying too much and doing too much with your solution. Um, the other, I think the biggest one really, was it's hard to adopt a new process for managing files. Um, the simple things, such as like when documents normally come in, maybe instead of going to individual people, they should go into some kind of box that they can then be scanned and then handed to an individual person. You know, shifting around how the paper flows through the organization, very difficult. Um, simple little steps that actually don't cost a lot of time, but from the mental energy and anguish, which I'm not making fun of, it's important, um, these things are, uh, uh, these little changes can be very big. Um, training and support was absolutely key throughout. When we were adopting new processes, we needed to do sort of ongoing training, have internal gurus such as ourselves and others that can constantly teach and reteach how we're doing things now going forward. Um, and also holding each other accountable. We had to have an office that was willing to do that. They say, well, if I'm going to do it this new way, so are you, and I'll be here to help you to do it. So yeah, we're both sort of in charge of cracking the whip, but really we're here to help, right? We're all each other's bosses in this, in this solution. Um, and then the last one's a bit, I suppose, negative, but it was, a, it was a, just a real um, fact, is that the solutions we were finding at UC Berkeley for managing um, electronic files um, were just too big and, and unwieldy for the small office. Um, they just weren't fitting. Um, and so that's why we ended up sort of doing sort of shoelaces and gum um, and, and existing systems to uh, make it happen. So. So that's sort of, in a nutshell, the case study that, of the UC Berkeley Senate. Um, great. Thank you. Hello, I'm Cindy Major, and I'm the coordinator of the Chancellor's Communications and Resource Center. Um, when I had led a meeting one time, I confided to somebody how nervous and scared I was, and they looked at me and go, that's, that's not fear, that's excitement. And so I'm going to, I am excited to be here. I'm really excited. <laughs> what it is is that it's really exciting to be in a room with people 
that get records management. And if you don't, hopefully after this symposium, you will start to get it. And um, to me, it's, it's always very exciting. There are boring parts of it. But um, it's, just, it's just something I get really excited about. And I want to thank Eric for doing most of my speech. It's going to be very short <laughs> and everything. But, but no, anybody who knows me knows I always have something to say. So we'll get started here. OK, so I'm talking about the experience of CCRC with electronics records management or the never-ending quest to go paperless. Ever since I start, we started with an electronic records management system in CCRC back in 1999. There's always been this ideal, this vision of going paperless. And um, so I'm going to take you on that journey a bit here. Let's see. Oops. I'm going to give you a quick, quick background on CCRC. That's the building where I work at. Um, it was established um, to provide a single repository for the chancellor's correspondence. And over the years, our mission has grown to implement a life cycle program of the archives, records management, and workflow integration within the office of the chancellor, chancellor and the senior administration that are housed in California Hall. And in 1994, excuse me, in 1994, we started using a customized client-based ERMS, CCRC tracker. And this is something that our office worked with IST with, and we, they developed this for us. We had been using PROFS, which some of you may have heard of in the library system, and um, but we wanted more. We wanted to be able to do workflow and those kinds of things. So we developed CCRC Tracker, and through the years, different components were added. The scanning in 1999, and then 2002, we had a web client uh, that was developed, and along with electronic workflow. And because of this, we were able to we started what was called the archive project. We had all these files in the attic of California Hall. We had files down at the SCM building. And the vision was to get these documents scanned, purge what we needed to, and bring it, in, bring it back on campus. Because people, in order to get stuff down at the SCM, it, it sometimes take three to four days to recover that document. Because you had to the person going down, the staff had to have a car on campus with a parking space and be able to go down there, go down into the basement of SCM, pull it out, <laughs> some people are not there, bring the box back, and, uh, and then try to find a parking space on campus. When uh, so most of the time, most of the time, the box was left in the car, in the passenger car seat, taken home, and then they brought it in with them in the morning. And um, so, we started on this project, and we were able um, to get scanned by 2006. We were able to get scanned all the documents from the SCM and the ones from uh, 1972 to 98 that were uh, into the tracker system. It was a, a quite, a, quite a project. We had uh, four staff at that time, and we had a student that was dedicated. We were lucky enough to find one. She wanted the money. So it was like really, we, she just really, um, it really helped a great deal. Then in uh, 2008, we moved, we be began converting over to the campus-supported EDRMS ImageNow. And, um, that conversion involved transferring all the documents that were in Tracker. It, it was a complicated process. We had to identify what metadata we could capture and that image now had space for on. Um, we had to make sure that it coincided with where it would be an image now. So we weren't having to unscramble the metadata after it was converted over. So um, we were able to do that so that by August 2009, we went live. And we were able to do all the wonderful things you do with scanning and retrieving. 
for both the client and the web users that were inside and outside California Hall. Because by this time, we had electronic workflow outside to associate cha vice chancellors and assistant chancellors that uh, action items would be sent to them. They were responsible, and then they would send it back to the vice chancellors and then give them to us. But that's what we thought. <laughs> it's like, yeah. So these are some of the problems that we experienced. Um, and this is after testing and a lot, of, a lot of meetings and everything. The searching component turned out to be very difficult to use and learn. And I'm not talking about just the users who occasionally go in to look for a document. I'm talking about me and our other coworker. Um, it was, it was, it was a, a, um, a process that was very different from the tracker one. So there was a very long learning curve on that, unfortunately. And also, it was turning out that all the documents weren't being retrieved in a search. That um, ImageNow was making its own little decision in the back on what documents it was going to show us as a result. And so we had to work through that to find out what was going on. That doesn't happen now. That's all taken care of. Um, but, it, but it created um, a lack of trust in our department so that Tracker was kept going. It was supposed to be decommissioned in August 2009. We kept it going until uh, early 2010, till we felt really comfortable with being able to find a document. Um, the other thing, the, another result of that searching component was clients were making their own copies and keeping them in their office. That was like, you know, so not what this was about because um, they just didn't want to deal with the searching component. And then our request, our document request, which had really gone down with Tracker because people were using the searching component for that, and we'd have one or two a month, and that was mainly with difficult advanced searches that needed to be done. We were starting to average like 10 a week. And that was, we were down then to like two people in our office. And it was becoming to where it was putting an increased load on us to be able to uh, recover these documents. Also, the workflow routing process confused the users. They would not open image now. So action items that were sent there by the chancellor's office were sitting there and they were not getting handled in a timely manner. And also, uh, a real important uh, thing for the chancellor's office staff was they would run status reports on documents that were still um, in the system, still out. And they would send reminders to people to be sure and respond to them. And we weren't able to run status reports with ImageNow. OK, what we learned was we the, the, all those problems were solved. <laughs> we had a re-implementation project in 2010. And then we, the searching component was improved and we had an upgrade that came along. But from this, we found out that not just the, the, the stake owners, like the chancellor's office and CCRC being involved in it, you really need to have the buy-in from the clients, from the client users. So we really reached out in the re-implementation program and involved the, the executive assistants that are the ones who do the work of bringing, uh, taking care of the, making sure that this is answered and getting this information to their executive. And, um, and now, since then, our, our buy-in our, for our users is just about 100%. There's still a few people that don't really, but they, they do have to use it, but it's not something they turn on and use all the time. And we have, because we, we handle for most of the um, people that are in California Hall, there are some um, units we don't do, but it's a really diverse range of documents and different office cultures on how things are, are how the executive deals with the paper that comes into them. So we realized we needed larger test piloting groups instead of just CCRC and the chancellor's office because um, it, people find out. They search for things in different ways. And they do the workflow maybe in a little different way. And you have to be very clear with the vendor and the project team that there are, there are office needs that have to be met before sign-off. 
Um, I think we were like sort of thinking that we could, okay, we can work around this, but it, it was not the case. So let me give you some tangible results from CCRC. Since we've been using uh, an EDRMS, we've had um, our, our hard file copies in the attic and in our office have been reduced. In 1993, this is before we started in with scanning, we had about 90 vertical file cabinets in the attic in our space, and that's been reduced to 18. Um, this little picture here, I'm very proud of it because that's about 80% of our files there. The ones to the right are empty and with the special boxes ready to go to archives when we're all set to go. And um, in our office, when I first started working, it was like a whole wall was covered with the file cabinets. And we have two now that are nice together off to the side. And um, also, as I've mentioned, the SCM, we did not have to pay on that anymore. Also, our, our, the, the workflow, the, the amount of times that people touched a document was really reduced. It's like one of the things we get really concerned about in our office is the integrity of the document. And this shows um, before the EDRMS. And so every time a document goes into somebody's office, there's always the risk of a page being lost, of coffee being spilled on it, of, of things happening to it that um, just really jeopardize us being able to save that document. So as you can see here, the least amount of times um, these, that a document can be handled is like three times and then maximum, well not even, it could even be more times, depending on how many times a document needed to be seen by the administrators. If the chancellor wanted like five other people to see this for information, it had to go to all those five people. And it was always coming to us. We were like a little library where we were like recharging and discharging this document and making sure it got into the mailbox of that office. Okay, now with EDRMS, okay. I have a little key down there at the bottom because it looks complicated, but it's not. It's so much easier now. So we receive the document. We receive documents by US mail, which is a great deal of what we did before email really took off. Now we depend a great deal on people bringing that document to us. And many times people come in and asking for a document saying, I know I saw it, I know I saw it. And it turns out to be an email and it wasn't given to us to be put into the system. So we've been having to work with offices to develop this, this mindset of, if it looks like CCRC might want it, give it to them. If you're not sure, give it to them. They will decide on that. And so we handle it, scan it, e-route it to all the offices, and then it goes physically into the file and electronically into CCRC file. And the only other people that handle the hard copy document is the chancellor's executive assistant. He wants to see these documents. He wants to make a choice on who should have the action on them. And, but, and they will give it back to us to go back to file. In the meantime, they're electronically sending them off to all the assistants. And then those assistants send them back to the file. So essentially, if something comes in for the executive vice provost or any, any other person that's not the chancellor, we scan it, electronically route it, and we put the file away, excuse me, and we put the, physically put the file away so that it's not being touched anymore. There. Also, the, the idea of the scan once and view many works really good for, for the work environment we are. We're not having lost documents. The integrity of the document is maintained, and we feel really confident when someone is asking for something that we are able to provide them with all the, that they're wanting. Because we get file requests from the public, from people wanting to know more history about, like, say, People's Park and these things, and we're able to hand them that, that file. They can either look at it if it's uh, an archive type of thing, or we can send it to them electronically now, which is what we're doing more and more of. And the other big thing is the disaster recovery. One of our biggest fears was something happening in that attic 
a fire or, or anything, or at the SCM. And uh, in fact, we had to help with some uh, files that were found up at the Clark Kerr campus that had been placed up there and sort of forgotten. They, were, uh, they had people's personnel files and everything like this, and they had been gotten into by rodents, rain damage, and things like that, and it was really sad. Uh, I mean, they weren't even what I consider my files, but it's really sad to see that happen, and they had to be gone through and recreated. So right now, we, if, any, if the big one hits, we're covered. Everything's all cool. And um, oops, so that's, that's essentially the end of it. Um, I just wanted to say one thing. Sorry, David. <laughs> There's something to say there. But um, one thing that is important is when we're talking about people buying in, uh, as, as well as the executive assistants, I think it's also something that we have to work with everybody that, that comes into the office, the students, uh, the administrators and all, so that they understand that these, because what happens a lot is these emails go back and forth and nothing is given to this the executive assistant and all. And so there's, there's still sometimes these little cracks in the loop on it, but it is getting very, very much better in our, um, in our group up there at California Hall. And, um, and you know what? That's all I have to say. We actually have 15 minutes for questions if you have any for Eric or Cindy. Okay. Oh, now, wait, 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 you have to do it on the microphone, so, yes. Well, with email being so prevalent, is there a way for your system to just drop emails in? Because it sounds like you have to copy it and scan the email, but it's already an electronic file, so, or, or you know, record. So can, mm -hmm. is there a way to just drop an email into the CCRC system? Mm -hmm. Uh, there, there is that image now has that capability to do that, but it would involve having access to the administrator's emails assistant because the way it is now is that the executive assistant reviews the email, forwards them to us. And um, yes, we can put it into the system without scanning, and we were doing that at the beginning with PDFs and attachments that were coming to us, but then we were getting concerned about uh, this, this PDF file that's coming in. It hasn't been scanned digitally, and so th there's that particular thing that still needs to be looked at because it, it would be wonderful to be able to just have it being sent to us, and then we just do the metadata, and that's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even even the the email now we're like um, scanning it in, and um, but yeah, it's 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 something we've talked about before about having access. But then again, we're not sure if we really want it. I right now it's really nice having that executive assistant making the decision, and she's really good about knowing what we're needing, and so that's how we're doing it right now. Yeah. Yes. We're not, we're not talking by phone or you know, necessarily mm -hmm. creating meetings. We're just sitting there all day, uh, literally having conversations through email. And you know, then they want us to recover the documents. And they're easy to do within your email system. You just drop them in a folder. Right. But then we have no system when people leave about how these uh, you know, email account uh, folders with all of our business records in it are put into any other record form. And the idea that you have mm -hmm. to copy an email and then yeah. do five other steps to it to get it as a record. I mean, this really, really needs to be handled if you want us to be able to respond and produce records. Right. Yes. I agree with you. Yes. 
Patrick, emails native support from Imagine Now. So. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Did everybody hear that? If you're um, going to have a question, could you please use the microphone? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, one, of the, one of the things, which is something that um, Eric brought up, is that whenever you're going to a new system, it does take time. And it has, as we've gone from profs to tracker to image now, there are still some things we sort of hang on to. Um, and part of it is, um, I think that there's still in our office, or me, since I'm in the office, um, this, this sense of, of, of the paper and, and all. And, but it's, I think we're so much better. We used to, oh my gosh, we used to keep everything before. And then, um, and we have this subject issue type of filing system that we use. And uh, we have really got it down to where it's really lean. And um, we don't have all that junk to search through anymore. Um, we used to keep all the invitations, everything that went into the vice chancellors and the vice provost. The only person we do that for now is the chancellor. Lisa Ho from IT Policy, and just yes. to follow back with the other comments made about email and being part of a one person's um, personal email uh, account, individual account, and this is an issue that's very dear to me. It comes up over and over again. Mm -hmm. We get questions about people that are leaving. Are my employees leaving? Are they taking that email with them? Um, and our, so we're looking to, we're planning to create some guidance on this and want input from others on that. You can contact us at itpolicy at berkeley.edu. Um, but generally, we're, we're saying to folks all the time, get a departmental email account that's not tied to an individual so that when they leave or even go to another department within, um, within the campus that, that the business records are part of the business. They, they belong with the department rather than an individual that when they leave their account actually stays with them for a while unless you ask for it to be cut off and that those records that are needed for uh, archiving or whatever long-term business records and can be accessed by the department on an ongoing basis. So a little bit, I'm sorry to detract, no. but it's so such a big issue in our area that I wanted to bring that up and put out the suggestion for departmental emails and be, or being able to create a, another email at, uh, in CalShare that you just add it to the CC line and it goes into a record, I'm, whatever it is, image now, there's a lot of different systems where you can set those uh, emails aside just by putting a CC on the email. We have a question up here, um, if you still have a question. Yeah, microphone, microphone. Raise your hand. Uh, you mentioned, Eric, that you had put, created categories and tried to simplify things through that. Could you talk a little bit about how you did that? Uh, sure. We, um, we, basically, um, when we started, there was a, a, a sort of a system in place, as I mentioned, that had a couple hundred documents in there, and it was an attempt to make a document management system. It was using FileMaker. Um, and there was these imagined categories, uh, um, including subject and category, um, but also author and date um, and um, origin of the document, um, a few other things. Um, and, and the bottom line was the, the, the Academic Senate um, uses the documents for research purposes. And um, what we did was we looked historically through what, what the research questions were, um, which was very hard to do. People were like, well, it could be anything. And I was like, well, like what? You know? And so we, can, we had those meetings about four times. And then, and then we, <laughs> we determined what the what was. Um, and, and that was very important because they weren't searching everything. There was very critical topics, subjects throughout each of the um, 33 committees, um, and we were able to wrestle that down to an architecture that was two layers deep, you know, a category with subtopics. And then we were also able to wrestle that down and not have every subtopic into every category and have all sorts of mishmashy stuff, but to really limit it to say each subcategory is one and it belongs to one and only one category, you know, to try to really refine this so that it meet the needs. So it was important to do that historical analysis. 
Any other questions? Yeah, I have a quick question. Now that everything has been um, digitized, so to speak, um, how is this stuff, where is it stored and how is it backed up? For, I, for, for Cindy, for example. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's, it's, um, it's stored off site and it's backed up from what I understand on a daily basis. Um, I'm afraid I can't tell you exactly where because I leave that to my IT person to I be able to. We're going to be covering that a little bit this afternoon. So yeah. I think Patrick will be talking about that as well mm -hmm. as I think Mary Ailings mm -hmm. in that session. I, I would yes. add that, um, it, that that question is extremely important. I, as we all saw with the uh, uh, mortgage industry collapse, nobody knew where their loans were because they kept <laughs> being um, you know, put out to. There's whole flow charts about where your money kind of was. Um, and, and the same thing is happening with online systems and backups. You don't, you're not really sure where it is unless you're really sure where it is. And so it's, it's really important to track that down. And in the, in the Senate, we used um, um, you know, UC backup systems to back up our server. But it was important for us to go to the next step and say, well, where do you put it? Well, it turns out it was all local on actual machines at the u university. So we could kind of go end to end and know where the data really was and not just be relying on it. And eventually it was some vendor that we didn't actually know what their policy was. Um, IT policy here does a really good job um, sleuthing out vendors and understanding what their contracts are and so forth. But um, it's just important for all of us to know that. Yeah. All right. Um, are, are there any questions for um, people from previous uh, sessions for, for them? as well. Um, so confidentiality and the legends on the bottom of the emails where it talks about keeping this email safe from you know, foreign entities or whatever. Um, and what, what, is there a policy? Should we be reading those legends in detail or conducting some kind of a legal um, search of whether or not they knew they were sending this to a public university? That's a good question. Yeah. I, I think there's an answer for that and... Um, Stella, okay. Hi, this is Stella Guy again. Thanks for the question. So uh, one example I can give you right off is when we have RFPs, um, there are different vendors who want University of California business, we select one. And uh, unfortunately, more and more over the years, the vendors who don't win want the other bids and they want the contract. And this causes a lot of work for us in the public records business. And sometimes you, you often get these vendors writing on their RFP responses, confidential, on every single page. Uh, what we say is that, well, just because someone writes confidential on something doesn't actually mean that it's confidential under the law. Uh, it can be helpful for our public records staff to see that because then, hey, that's a, that's a highlight. That's a, hmm, I should talk to this person about why they think this is sensitive. But the confidential designation that's there has, there's a separate analysis of whether there's any purely personal information or information that would be deemed private under the law. Does that answer your question at all? Oh, good. Okay, we have time for one more question if, if there is one. Going once, going twice, <laughs> going three times. Okay, um, thank you very much, appreciate it.